Hello everyone and thank you all so much for coming to this talk. My name is Mark Johnson, I'm a lecturer at the University of Sydney and this talk is about mental health and mental illness and also making money through game live streaming on Twitch. So let's get started. Twitch, or rather specifically game live streaming on Twitch, has been my main area of research for the last five or six years. And throughout this time, I have conducted a large number of interviews with both full-time professional and also aspiring semi-professional Twitch streamers. And I've also carried out a large body of um, also ongoing ethnographic work, both online on the Twitch platform itself and also in, ver in various countries at offline uh, Twitch-related or live streaming-related events in the UK, in the US, in Germany, Poland, and also in Brazil. And like I say here, my uh, research on Twitch game streaming is ongoing. And one thing which I should just stress is um, in order to maintain confidentiality for our respondents, none of the picks in these slides specifically relate to the streamers who offered the quotes on, uh, on the slides in question. They are there more broadly just to give a general sense of what Twitch looks like and what the kind of range of uh, games and streamers and channels and so on on Twitch looks like. So, in light of what this conference is, I'm sure we all know what Twitch is, but in case you aren't particularly familiar with the platform or maybe haven't spent that much time there, uh, Twitch is a platform which, for the most part, uh, is focused on the live streaming of game content, and Twitch is huge. Uh, even prior, prior to COVID, the site boasted somewhere in the range of 2 million people who regularly broadcast themselves on the platform, and well over 100 million people who regularly watched uh, game or in some cases non-game content on Twitch and my work has in general tended to kind of focus on issues and questions of labor and work and monetization for Twitch streamers um, though now I am increasingly moving more towards a more um, cultural study of the platform but one of the main research questions which I've had in the last few years is how do issues of mental health and mental illness and game live streaming intersect? So one of our key findings within this space in terms of the inclusivity possibilities which Twitch game streaming offer was the range of different mental health issues which live streamers who, who we talked with reported having. So. For example, we had um, a uh, veteran from the US Army with PTSD who found Twitch to be a very, very rewarding space both to make a living and to um, be part of a wider and more supportive community. We also had um, someone who had been diagnosed with ADHD who found Twitch also a very positive and very rewarding space. And one, and one streamer with social anxiety explained to us that they felt almost no anxiety when broadcasting on Twitch. And this quote here in the middle, I think, is quite striking here, where the ability of a Twitch streamer to, in essence, control and to maintain control over their channel and the chat within their channel gives a sense of being able to be in control and to have power, which... Uh, anxiety often robs one of. In turn, we had another streamer uh, also who reported suffering from long-term depression who um, explained that they were very open to people on Twitch chat talking to them about this issue and that they'd found that um, Twitch could be a very positive space for people to share these sorts of problems, both streamers and viewers, but also noted that due to the intimacy of Twitch streaming, it is very hard to, to hide these sorts of issues from, from your uh, viewers. So if you do broadcast on Twitch, in most cases, one's viewers will, as time goes by, get a decent kind of sense of where your head space is and what sorts of issues there might be. Another intriguing point here is that lots of game streamers who do themselves struggle with mental illness or other mental health issues is that we've seen the emergence of a fairly um, distinctive type of stream which these sorts of broadcasters make, which is the so-called 
pos positivity stream. Um, and if you go into these sorts of channels on Twitch, um, as you'll see from those middle quotes, um, there's a very specific framing of what these sorts of sorts of channels should be, both in terms of the kind of content being broadcast, in terms of how the streamer acts, in terms of what kinds of viewers are welcomed, in terms of what kinds of interactions be between viewers and between the viewers and the streamer are encouraged, and so on. And these are kind of channels which are specifically meant to be kind of mental health resources both for the streamer and for the uh, viewers and many of these channels as well as one might expect have in some cases quite distinctive rules which one might not find on other channels so for instance a lot of these have a kind of general no uh, hate speech rule which is fairly common on twitch but lots of these channels also have more specific rules e.g. no mention of suicide or self-harm or these sorts of topics even if they are mentioned in jest and this makes these sorts of sh these sorts of channels in many ways quite distinct from the more kind of hostile abrasive or more competitive side of games and gaming both on and beyond twitch what we therefore see here is that these sorts of game streamers have been able to draw on their own experiences and their own struggles to create very different and very distinctive virtual places both for their fans and for themselves and this is especially noteworthy i think in the broader context where within geek culture as a whole of which of course gaming is a big part um those who are not white straight male cis and so on are increasingly under attack within these sorts of spaces and contexts but here instead we see the potential for those who who in most cases tend to be demographically excluded from many uh cultural and economic options within geek culture and on the web more broadly being able to instead create their own spaces and build communities and even careers around them. However, it is not all good news. So as my work and the work of some others has shown, the working hours on Twitch for those who do Twitch as a part-time income and especially for those who do or who aspire to do Twitch game streaming as their full-time income can be intense. Many streamers will stream five, six, seven, eight hours a day, in some cases every day or, or most days, and some streamers will even go so far as to uh, as to broadcast every day of the week for weeks or months or even in some extreme cases for years um, and this and this clear and this clearly would be a challenge for anyone but can be even more of a challenge for those who are already struggling with mental health so for instance in this first quote we see how these kinds of um, expected norms of how much time someone should spend on twitch can be quite tough for some twitch streamers and in this and in the second quote this case i think is especially illustrative here as it, as it shows someone who had um this streamer who we talked with had recovered from a serious medical operation and had found themselves with without the uh, energy and the focus and all these sorts of things to stream as much as they used to and that fact itself quote disappointed a lot of people so here we see i think how these kinds of work or labor norms on twitch which are tough for all streamers to some extent will also be tougher for for others it is also important here to keep in mind the issue of trolling which is present on twitch as in pretty much any other online social space and this is also an issue which does tend to affect more marginalized or disadvantaged people or communities more than others um, and what was clear from what our respondents had to say is the dealing with trolls or hate speech or slurs and so on is tough for any game streamer of course but might well be tougher for those with pre-existing mental health con mental health conditions in turn, it's useful to think about how some of the norms of what streamers should be doing outside of working hours might also be trickier for those with certain mental health conditions. 
For instance, lots of Twitch streamers uh, find that if one wants to be, in air quotes, successful on Twitch, then a crucial part of this is trying to keep track of things like stats and metrics and figures and seeing how many, how many, how many viewers watched your channel and what countries they came from and what games they enjoyed watching and all these sorts of things in order to use this kind of, quanti this kind of quantitative data to enhance one's channel. As one might expect, um, it is easy for streamers to feel, to feel bad or feel down if their numbers drop and things of this sort, especially when those, num those same numbers are seen as so essential and so important. And I don't think it's hard to see here how this kind of expectation could or would exacerbate existing issues such as anxiety or depression. In turn, as these lower two quotes show, Twitch streaming in general can be something of an emotional roller coaster. And once more, of course, if one's ability to handle the sharp ups and downs of something like this are reduced, I think it's quite clear how more strongly negative outcomes for some of, for some of these Twitch streamers might then take place. So what about the economic outcomes on Twitch? Well, what is very clear here is that for streamers with mental illness or mental health issues, Twitch offers a very uh, compelling and very valuable space, both in which to make money and also to boost their mental health and, and also to create and spend time in and put time and effort into safer spaces for mental health issues than one tends to find throughout most of uh, gaming. And although the interviewees who we talked to for this project often expressed issues around the stress, the working hours, the anxiety problems and so forth, they were also strongly united in their appreciation of both the economic and the inclusion opportunities which Twitch game streaming had given them. And so what we see here is that is the game streamers who do have a focus on mental health have in essence been able to carve out quite significant and quite a distinctive niche on Twitch while also trying and in most cases being able to find ways to not to, to deal with or to navigate both the social norms and the technological interfaces of Twitch as a platform. So to quickly sum up, what I hope to have done here is to have given you all a sense of how mental health and mental illness on Twitch uh, play out in essence and how Twitch both does allow streamers with existing mental health issues to make money, to find a full-time job, to create or build or be part of very supportive and very safe and inclusive communities and so on. But on the other hand, as we've seen, both the kind of infrastructural technologies and expectations of Twitch and in turn the broader kind of social norms of how Twitch streamers, especially aspirational Twitch streamers, are meant to act can also in turn cause quite a lot of difficulties and challenges. And so Twitch, in essence, is structured by many of the same inequalities as non-streaming activities. And those with these sorts of issues do have to, in most cases, work harder in order to attain equivalent status or success on the platform. But that status and success on Twitch is genuinely open to those with mental health issues. Thank you all so much for listening to this talk. If you'd like to read the paper it was based on, please go to tinyurl.com slash twitch disability and you can read about it there. And if you have, have any comments or questions or queries, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me at the email address there. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Bye for now. I'm very happy to present my current work on eSport in particular. The, um, uh, sorry, Matt. Would you mind to go for the page two? Because I have to use VPN to access this um, this software, this APP. So it's really hard for me to share my PowerPoint. So Matt will help me to uh, go for the PowerPoint. And I would like to speed up 
uh, my research on two parts. The first is about my research about the, the platformization of infrastructure and the infrastructuralized of the platform to looking at the Chinese eSport industry. And the second part is to looking at how the Chinese players, the eSport players are, st uh, are stigmatized by the, um, the, the political and the, uh, capital and the cultural factors. Uh, in nowadays, and I put up some um, my my current thoughts about this industry, in particular, how this kind of issues could be sorted out uh, to make the whole industry sustainable. In particular, when we concerning this kind of young athletes, um, can you hear me clearly? Sorry to double check. Yep, we can hear you. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, the page two is my uh, publication about eSport and uh, I've, I've, um, I've concerned about uh, the, the, pla the, the platforms and of eSport and concerned about the uh, complexity of the career development of the eSport athlete and uh, also uh, how particularly, for example, currently I have a paper that is under uh, review uh, under um, peer review uh, about how the eSport industry in China could be considered as sport or uh, considered as creative uh, cultural creative industry. So which way is better approach to looking at more sustainable? And also I'm looking at how the the education, in particular the the literacy that help this kind of industry sustainable, because a lot of the mental health problems. So um, briefly introduce the, the rise of the platformization of eSports in China. So page four. Um, so there are some important in the year uh, when we're talking about eSports in China. The first is in 2003, the State General Administration of the Sport of China approved the eSports as country's 1990s official sport. And also in 2016, China surpasses the United States as the world's largest largest digital gaming market. And also in 2018, the revenue from online and offline PC and mobile eSports and games in China has exacted um, $13.63 billion and over 350 million consumers playing the mobile eSports and game, which compromised more than half of this revenue. So that's why when we interview the Tencent, uh, the largest uh, media conglomerates in eSports, um, which has put a lot of effort to, to develop more uh, mobile eSports games. And uh, my research employed the infrastructure study and the platform study to looking at how the case study of Tencent um, um, developed their digital empire uh, in, in, in China. So next page, my research question is, do Tencent eSports and the Chinese government role in managing the eSport platformization and their own infrastructure ambitions complement oppose or compete with each other. So my research proposed, um, uh, next page, proposed a, con a concept concept framework, the on-brand platform of Chinese eSport. So one on one hand, looking at the on-brand clause from the regulatory platformization of in infrastructure. On the other hand, I'm using the umbrella stand to looking at the growth of the value chain of the multi-sided platforms of Tencent eSport in China. So next page. Um, so in terms of umbrella clause, the Chinese eSport actually attribute um, quite interdisciplinary, including the entertainment, media, sport, and uh, uh, and there are over eight departments uh, in China actually supervise this eSport industry. So uh, actually before 2010, there are some departments launched some conflict policies um, to supervise the eSport, but now it's more clear, but actually in practice i found that the department uh either from the cultural or from the media from the uh, uh broadcasting so they they try to you know 
kick the balls to each other, and they they try to they don't want to um, they don't want to um, manage the 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 esport industry by their own. Um, so the Chinese government can be described as umbrella clause of infrastructure infrastructure of digital platforms because it determine the the life cycle and the expansion of Chinese esport and uh, the video games. And uh, next page. But also, uh, because of some gossip, uh, the the industry from the two thousand fourteen until right now has significantly changed. Uh, so, which means the China, the esports broadcast has been limited to the internet after uh, since two thousand four. Which means that um, next page. Um, which means that actually the the Chinese esport is quite rely on live streaming to do the content discrimination, discrimination, which is quite different from the way that the Korea do. In Korea, that is the top down way, but in China, that is bottom up way. So um, the page eleven. Uh, so actually, in two two thousand sixteen, the esports in China entered a new stage because the Chinese government put a lot of effort to 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 bring in the the digital technologies from other states and in, encourage the industry to improve the development of mobile games, live streaming services, and a VR technology, and also funded the initiatives to organize the international and the national based professional uh, esports tournaments. Uh, for example, I don't know whether of you have heard that before, called a uh, One Bell One Road Esport Tournament. So very political. And the, the fourth is the government encouraged the Chinese college and the universities to offer the professional esports courses. Um, so after 2016, um, next page marked, um, the, the esports industry chain has been accomplished uh, in this way. So we have upper string, middle string and the bottom string. From the upper string that is focus on the content licensing and the middle string that is for the uh, tournaments and organization but the bottom string is all about content promotion through live streaming because that the, the tournament is limited to broadcast through the TV set through the digital TV programs so next page so right now Tencent is the top one the media conglomerates in um, um, gaming uh, revenue uh, worthwhile, and, uh, and when uh, in my research, I have found that Tencent used the uh, the 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 capital investment way in in particular external um, gaming companies. For example, on page fourteen uh, of my slides, um, Tencent has um, occupied one hundred and one hundred percent. Uh, sh of of the shareholders of the riots, which belongs to USA, and also um, he invested a lot of company like from Korea, from uh, Finland, from France. Uh, so so those those states are very strong and uh, advanced in esports. But Tencent used the the way of investment to try to you know to weigh out. Mm. Next page. So in 2017, the Tencent's total revenue from online games approached the um, 197.18 billion RMB. So, which means that more than half of that comes from mobile games and become the world's largest gaming company. So when I interviewed the 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 athlete with the, uh why why you choose Tencent games? Why not uh why not go for um, net easy, so another uh, big company in China uh, for, for their esports tournament, but they say it's 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 too difficult because that is one hundred percent cost. If you would like to draw up, uh, if you would like to um, give up the Tencent circle, you know. So on on page sixteen, um, so Tencent's role in Chinese esports has um, played 
in three ways. The first is Tencent has become a major executive of the gaming leagues, including the KPL, KC, KCC, and the KOC, and runs many significant tournaments, including the LPL and LSP, uh, LSPL. And the second is Tencent had its own um, brand and also its own brand of the internet. In, in, Esport, uh, it's called the TGA, which is founded in 2010. And the third is the top clubs of China's LPL were supported by Tencent, which is um, uh, why Tencent tried to build up its physical infrastructure by locating these clubs in six of the top so called first and sixth and second tier cities in China. Next, um, so I've mentioned the button line and uh, the button string of the value chain in China is live stream. But when you're looking at the Tencent, um, the strategy of investment, you found that actually uh, Tencent not only set up a mobile esport brand, the PG esport, but also invested in the leading live stream platforms, including Douyu and Huya. So actually, when when you try to looking at the number of the live, live uh, broadcast of professional in, events, for example, in two thousand eighteen in the LPL tournaments, which has generated seven point billion viewers, and uh, there are over one point three uh, one point three eight billion hours of viewing time. So that's a huge, huge viewers uh, through uh, to 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 watch the tournaments through live stream uh including the um including a lot of people even though they watch the tournament but they don't play games so that is how it is influenced so uh i have to speed up go for page 24. Um, so that is the conclusion of my first research to looking at the umbrella platform of Tencent eSport in China. So which means how Tencent used the uh, digitalized platforms and uh, infrastructure of platformization to build up its empire, its eSport empire. And uh, uh, the red one, the red circle, actually refers to how they use the digital logic try to to try to build up its empire. And the the first entry is their QQ, their QQ users. So I have to uh, I have to introduce um, my second part because of the time limit. Uh, the the when I'm looking at the the people, the 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 ask the the players. Um, in eSport in China, I try to use the stigma power to looking at how, whether they self perceive themselves as professional players. So I have keep asking, are you athlete? Are you sure you're athlete? Um, are you sure you're athlete? <laughs> so sort of the question actually uh, comes up different logic. In the first period, uh, bet between, um, how to say, um, pre 2011 i found that the the, the the players the professional players are actually hard to uh, identify themselves as a professional athlete because of the uh the, the social norms rooted in china um and the the way that uh they try to play has been considered for a long time as hero uh as the um, you know they are opposite with the positive moral in china so it's really hard for them um uh even though they they um have got a lot of great achievement in the tournament but um after after 2011 to 2016, there are three main factors actually driven uh, the the whole industry, driven their career path has changed a lot. Uh, so go for 13, page 32. Uh, the first is what I have introduced before, the, the Chinese government policy that has supported the whole industry. And also including the, the, the new job has been officially launched by the government in 2016. Uh, 19. So there's a, the two. There are two new jobs that which is called uh, eSport player and uh, eSport athlete and eSport management. Uh, you pay, I'm really sorry. I will ask you to wrap up now. Um, in, okay. In, like because yeah. 
So just, yeah, one minute to wrap up, because I'm sure we can also read uh, as well, right? I mean, if you pop, yeah. pop it uh, in, in the chat. Okay, so the my, my, my last point here is, my question rise up here is, because of the bottom line, bottom string of the value chain, live streaming is is the only channel for, for eSports to disseminate the content. So actually a lot of great athletes put a lot of efforts uh, to, on, on live streaming. So which means that their career path has significantly changed because of live streaming. So I have no idea what exactly live streaming right now, what kind of role they play in the whole industry, whether they help the whole industry sustainable. So that is my question. The second question is what exactly the education played right now uh, to help the whole industry play, uh, help this athlete uh, to move on their career. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. You play for the fascinating world of uh, esports athletes and, and the political economy I really enjoy as uh, as it were. So, uh, Manoli, Manolis, uh, are you here? You, you're good to go? I'm here. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Um, give me just one moment to share my screen. Um... Perfect. Okay. Um, I have to say that uh, I'm happy to be here and that I had prepared a beautiful 20 minute uh, academic talk, but now I will need to squeeze it and um, actually no problem. Um, if there are more questions, uh, we'll have time later. Um, uh, the second thing I want to say is that um, um, I'm not. Uh, I don't come from uh, from uh, gaming studies. I come from history of science. Um, so I will not start with gaming, but I think I will end with um, uh, some thoughts about it. So um, in what follows, I will attempt to uh, to take advantage of uh, this provenance from history of science to bring up some historiographical issues pertaining to the new affordances provided by digital history. Uh, let me start with a bold statement. History is not, about, is not only about what happened in the past, but also about what didn't finally happen, about events that were eventually flushed out by the propulsion of historical movement. This class of events constitutes a kind of historical cost a spectral presence which, notwithstanding its crucial role in the course of things, is never or rarely included in the causal chains that bridge the present with the past. What is the na nature of such events? They are mostly cancelled potentialities, incomplete projects, unfulfilled expectations, or simply and most commonly irrelevant factors. In history of science, we have quite a few such instances. Um, why such projects, ideas and actors are important? Because the whole spectrum of unrealized, cancelled and unfulfilled potentialities determines historical outcomes to the same extent as manifestly crucial events do. It is a truism that historical outcomes are multicausal. It's not much of a truism, though, to state that many of these causes do not have a direct impact, but are factors that formed the general shape of things that made a particular outcome possible. In this sense, the cancelled and the actualized potentialities are equivalent parts of historical reality, and historians are actually unable to capture the general shape of things without giving a full account of both. So, how can we capture this transparent causality? Or better, can we capture, how can we capture historical contingency, which is the result of multiple complex causalities that led the course of things? This is exactly where digital history comes into play. 
Maybe it's a bit of a rush to speak of digital history before we clear up the concept of digitality. But in the context of this short communication, of course, we cannot afford the luxury of a long theoretical discussion. So let's try to proceed by taking the agreement in the use of terms for granted. How can digital history promote the retrieval of the past and especially of those factors which, although shaped historical outcomes, are absent from the mainstream causal reconstructions of the past? I suggest that one crucial contribution of the digital mediation has to do with the transformation of the nature of and the relation with the archive. The last few years, there is an intense discussion among historians, archivists, and museologists focusing on the nature of historical documents and the new ways they can be classified and organized in order to become more eloquent. The transformations brought about by digital mediation concern three aspects of this process. One aspect has to do with the uh, quantitative transformation of an established practice. Database building. The use of digital means allows the building of huge databases, their functional interconnection, and the common use of metadata in the context of the so-called semantic web. I wish to underline the characterization quantitative. Things that we already did are now being done faster, more reliably, and more efficiently. But they are not new things. They are not new things as far as the habitus of the archive is concerned. The other two aspects, however, are immanent to the digital. Archive 2 is not, uh, is not a classified collection of historical documents anymore. It's a hypertext. An important consequence of the transition to the digital is that the local archive loses its specificity and locality. The well-defined, protected, and often inaccessible individual collection becomes part of a bigger structure where it is in constant interaction with other units that mutually redefine their limits and subject matters. The meaning of the documents does not reside anymore in their particular nature or in the questions asked by historians. It arises from their interaction, their mutual signification, and their positioning in ever-growing semantic context. A hypertext is a fluid substance that always displays itself by means of a sample representing its potential and, and not its actual or definite content. We do not really read hypertexts. We simultaneously create and read them. And this simultaneity is a radically new quality underpinning a new form of cultural experience. Already 20 years ago, Lev Manovich stressed the importance of a new practice as far as the digital space was concerned. Navigation. It comes as no surprise that hypertext was one of his main inspirations, the other being gaming. No two people read the same text. And this assumption does not have to do with a postmodern emphasis on the creativity of the reader, but primarily with the literal sense that starting from the same initial conditions, reader may and actually do inscribe different trajectories in a virtual literary space. So, databases, hypertext, navigation. Put together, these three elements outline a new context for historical research. I cannot guarantee, of course, that this is the only possible description of digital history, but I'm pretty sure that these elements and their combination form part of every possible description of the new ways of doing history. Something is missing, though. Which is the particular quality of the digital that ties these elements together? so as to produce a radical transformation in the art of history. Strange as it may sound, this quality is virtuality. We are accustomed to associate the virtual with illusions produced by computers. But in philosophy, things are different. Gilles Deleuze 
retrieves Leibniz's concept of virtuality in order to assign it a central position in his own philosophy. In the context of his philosophical project, the virtual acquires a positive value and is related with the notion of potentiality rather than with imagination or probability. It comes as no surprise that Pierre Lévy, one of the earliest theorists of cyberculture, draws heavily on Deleuze to explore the nature of the digital virtuality. In his book, Qu'est-ce que le virtuel, he more or less describes the emerging digital condition as a new stage of virtualization in the history of humanity. The previous stages of virtualization that shaped human civilization were the emergence of language, the emergence of tool, and the emergence of the institutions. The virtualization of the body, messages, and the economy, he remarks, referring to the various individual expressions of digitalization, illustrates a much more general contemporary trend towards virtuality. I believe we should consider this movement as the pursuit of a continuous process of hominization. Our species is in fact constituted in and by virtualization. As a result, the mutation that is currently taking place can be interpreted as a resumption of humanity's drive toward self-creation. I should content myself with this very sketchy confirmation of the affirmative character of virtualization and promptly turn to the importance of this quality to historical studies. The process is described earlier as database building, dynamic reading of hypertext and navigating through a virtual space of documents are moments of one and the same process, the reenactment of the past through the virtualization of the archive. Simply put, I claim that going digital in historical research means to increase the degrees of freedom of the documents by creating dynamic links among them and to activate their agency by staging their interaction unrestricted by the actual historical outcome. The purpose of this enterprise is not to open black boxes or to find missing factors, but to reenact historical contingency itself. According to Deleuze, the opposite of the virtual is not the real, but the actual. And according to Levy, every particular actualization is one of the many possible solutions to the problem specified by the virtual. The reduction of a set of documents and evidence to their virtual status enables us to ask questions like how things might have been if, and receive answers in the form of alternative actualizations, which are made possible thanks to digital means. This might be an especially productive way to bring forward the broad spectrum of unrealized, cancelled, and unfulfilled potentialities that define particular historical outcomes. It becomes evident that the transition to digital history centers around the possibility of creating a virtual space where documents and historians will interact in new ways. The title of this communication refers to the gamification of the past, and it's not only an attempt to fit the context of this meeting. It is a rather literal invocation of a new cultural technology that may, that may prove particularly pertinent to the new ways of doing history. I do not mean, of course, that we should be wasting our time devising imaginary context and exploring hypothetical scenarios. In fact, this has nothing to do with the virtual in the strict philosophical sense. The virtual is neither imaginary nor hypothetical, but I do mean that the reenactment of historical contingency might greatly profit from the expertise that has been acquired in an area where the handling of the virtual is the main state. A direct, uh, and uh, I'm closing my, my conclusion, uh, a direct con uh, consequence of the digital turn is a radical change of the character of history. As a form of cognitive enterprise of the world, history has long embraced the ideal of objectivity of scientific knowledge. Actually, throughout the 19th and the early 20th centuries, 
the discipline of history occupied a prominent position in the realm of positivism. But as a form of political discourse, history has also been pressed to get involved with action and thus to be exposed to the uncertainty of the incidental. The defense of theory against action defined to a great extent the character of academic history. I suggest that the digital turn may decisively affect this constitutional imbalance. The possibility of reenacting, reactivating the past liberates historiography from the obsessive pursuit of objective knowledge, while at the same time brings forward the intensely and unavoidably political character of the cognitive enterprise. Thus, it should not be surprising that digital history has already been used by various disenfranchised groups to reclaim not their past or present, but the trajectory that connects them and the alternative futures that may arise from it. Because, as William Gibson puts it, future is inherently plural. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manoli. Uh, you have um, you you have basically made us all digital historians now, and um, I, I really enjoy to have a, a little shot of theory inside uh, all proceedings, so we can uh, take some intellectual pleasure. Um, so, Vasilis Karagianopoulos from the University of Portsmouth, um, and now we're going to enter a, a different sphere, I think, as well. So, please. Vasily. Yeah. Vasily, okay. I, I can hear I, you, yes. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so, as you say, <laughs> my presentation will be very different to my analysis. Um, it's, a, it's a much more practical uh, and less theoretical dimension, but hopefully uh, we can see the links between all the presentations that, that we've seen so far. So, let me try to share my screen and see if I manage to follow uh, Matt's instructions correctly. Um, slides. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Right. Um, you can see. The slides, it says it's paused for me, uh, but it says my stream is still running, so... We can definitely see Yes. It. Uh, I mean, can you let yeah. me know? Can you I, see I the slides? I think we can. Matt, uh, can you confirm? Yeah. Are, are yeah. they moving? Yep, they are. All right, brilliant. So, um, how much time do I have? I uh, well, um, maximum break. 15, but if you put it in 12, uh, I mean, between okay. no, something no, no, like no. that, because I'm, I'm worried that we won't get any time for open discussion, which I really enjoy. No yeah. worries. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll try. I'll try and be quick. Okay. I, I knew that might be the case because I was last, so I've tried to condense. I think my... Callum is after <laughs> you as well. So, so there's one more speaker after oh, you. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll bear that in mind. I'll bear that in mind. So, um, thank you all for for coming. Um, as I said, uh, my presentation will be a little bit different. Um, so, I will be speaking about an initiative that um, I'm leading on at the University of Portsmouth, and it's called the Cybercrime Awareness Clinic. Um, and what we are doing is um, various different uh, projects and research with different vulnerable groups in the community, um, locally, regionally, nationally, and even internationally. Uh, with, with different projects, as I'll explain. So the idea was to create a, a structure um, that did not exist before, um, and it meant that we will uh, be creating a grassroots initiative to take into account what the public and, and what these groups actually want to see in terms of um, support and advice in relation to cyber awareness and the different problems people face online. Um, so, we have dealt with uh, different groups such as older adults and, and businesses, and we continue to do so. But today, obviously, I'm going to be speaking about uh, our engagement with, with young people and their relevant projects in relation to that. So, um, the first project we started was funded by the local constabulary, the local police, for those not in the UK. 
um, and, and had three aims. First of all, to do a public engagement, um, do public engagement events uh, with young people and schools and colleges, um, do research in terms of an online survey with young people um, in the community, and then also create a blueprint uh, for similar projects to be created in different parts of the country. I'm really happy to say that uh, Swansea is now considering a similar kind of structure uh, to ours. So, as I said, we have three focal points and the main focus uh, about today is obviously young people. Um, so, we have an underlying philosophy. We wanted to create a grassroots, multi stakeholder uh, collaborative body. So, we wanted to place ourselves in the heart of the network, and I know a lot of theorists are here relating to network theory um, and so on. So, in a way, we wanted to be uh, sort of like a super node in, in this network of stakeholders where we would try to be a semi quasi central point um, for, for the different stakeholders that are interacting in this area, um, involving the city council, the local police, uh, supporting charities and other organizations, and obviously schools, colleges, young people themselves, youth groups, um, and so on. Um, <clears throat> We, we do appreciate the, the benefits of, of doing like formal research, but um, what we try to do was actually combine the formal research with some hands on experience in terms of going into these organizations and interacting with the stakeholders involved in the young people directly um, in order to get a more in depth understanding of the problems and the solutions. Um, in many cases, when doing research with young people, we were sort of forced to not sanitize, but be careful about how we would phrase our research questions um, so that we can respect, obviously, the sensitivities of the young people, but also um, some concerns that the organizations allowing us to do research might, might have had. Um, and that obviously uh, restricted how much we were able to ask and, and know through the research, but through our regular interaction with stakeholders, we were able to get a more in-depth understanding of, of how things were working out. So, um, we tried to engage with uh, various schools and um, any, any of you that might have tried the same will know that it's a very big challenge to, <laughs> I can see Athena smiling, uh, it's a very big challenge to find uh, schools willing to allow you to do even an assembly. Um, we wanted to go in and do public engagement, as I said, and offer some cyber crime awareness advice and support for young people. And um, we were only given very brief kind of slots in assemblies on a regular basis. The other problem was schools and the young people in the schools were suffering from advice fatigue. Um, so the, the schools need to do a lot in terms of Ofsted obligations, obviously relating to cyber, um, and, and young people tend to get a lot of different advice and guidance. So we found that the schools um, were not really that positive in this respect because everyone seemed to have received advice from various different uh, angles, let's say. Uh, colleges were more eager um, and it was very interesting because the, the mix of the students was uh, very diverse, both in terms of age groups, but also in terms of, of backgrounds. Um, uh, schools tended to be a little bit more homogenous, I would say. Um, but schools had better responses, response rates to research when they actually decided to engage. So um, that was uh, positive. We had done some pilot research before, so we supplemented our understanding and, and findings uh, through that pre uh, research, pre clinic research that we had done with a couple of schools as well in order to get a better understanding. So um, we spoke uh, to nearly 400 young people, um, did research actually online surveys, which were quite extensive, um, and, and we found some basic conclusions. First one is obviously there's quite a lot of fatigue in terms of the general advice, mainly not, not just because they get a lot of advice, but also in the way that the advice is presented, because it, it's very much framed and phrased in a way that reflects the adult kind of mentality of safeguarding, don't do this, don't do that, this is dangerous. Um, but it's not always as, as justified and as legitimized as it should be. Um, and therefore, a lot of the young people actually told us that they felt 
the advice was not relevant to them, um, the one they received from their teachers or their parents, um, and, and they felt that um, they knew more in many cases than what their parents or teachers would know about certain things. Um, at the same time, you know, they, they felt the advice was obsolete um, and they suggested that they were getting a lot of advice from friends or, or siblings uh, or other people their age uh, that could understand perhaps their concerns. Cyberbullying was really common and this obviously relates to the platforms that we are talking about. We found that a lot of the young people were being bullied in online platforms and gaming platforms as well and that was very um, very common problem and reporting it to schools um, was not very straightforward. Schools sometimes were not very positive in terms of uh, taking active steps to deal with the problem um, and in fact the reporting sometimes led to retaliation as well against the person reporting the bullying which obviously is very problematic. There were also grooming risks um, and, and young people knew of, of these concerns. They demonstrate a good level of awareness. Uh, obviously it's one of the top topics that is being discussed in relation to safeguarding in schools. Um, but incidents of people meeting uh, older older adults uh, in uh, in platforms or face to face uh, and doing video streaming still existed and and sexting seemed to be very normalized. Um, one thing I, I usually say is that you know with uh, the sixteen year olds, for example, we found that uh, fifty percent of the boys and one third of the girls said it was okay to sex when in a relationship, and fifty percent of the respondents said they had sent nudes of themselves to others um, when they were asked to. So um, again, this for us indicated a certain kind of mentality that demonstrates this has now become a normal kind of sexual uh, behavior, and uh, there's no point in trying to restrict it in terms of telling people it's dangerous. Um, it's more a matter of trying to empower them and, and give them ways that they can be more um, in control of what they're sharing uh, and who they're sharing it with. Um, we found that a lot of the young people were being exposed to extremist self-harm and inspiration. This relates to pro-anorexia, pro-bulimia content online um, and all these self-harming challenges like the Blue Whale Challenge, for example. Um, and uh, it was obvious that youth critical thinking is key, which informed you know, the responses that, that we were developing and still develop. Um, it was a lot of hacking and virus victimization, and some of the young people actually indicated that they were trying this themselves. They were the perpetrators rather than the victims in some cases. Um, and we found that there wasn't enough clarity in terms of their understanding of what actions were illegal and what weren't illegal. Um, so I think that was a really important finding in terms of uh, orientation of advice towards a, a better understanding of what activities can be uh, offensive and can be considered offenses in the criminal sense as well. Um, there was an overall awareness of security measures, but application was really patchy, so we didn't really find most of the uh, responses were around 50% of the respondents in terms of the different measures, which indicates that people know what they should be doing, but a lot of them just do partially what they should be doing and they don't have a complete kind of way of dealing with the problems. And one of the main concerns was that the, the platforms that young people were frequenting were changing constantly. And this is a very common problem for parents and, and law enforcement as well in terms of monitoring behavior and monitoring criminal activity on these platforms. Uh, people move and young people move from platform to platform very regularly and, and when there are problems with one platform they move to another platform. So it's very hard for parents and uh, educators to keep up as well in terms of dealing with the problems that crop up. So we have published a public facing report on our website and I will share the link at the end. Um, and uh, for this initiative, we won the National Cyber Award, uh, sponsored by the National Police Chiefs Council. Um, and um, this resulted in, in further funding. So we have received some European Commission funding on a project on online and offline counter radicalization of young people. Um, and I'll explain what that involves. And currently, we're also working on a, on a new project, which is funded by the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner in Hampshire. 
um, and relates to a, a peer uh, support scheme, which is called Cyber Ambassadors. So Orpheus, um, as I said, involves uh, various different European countries. It's in the two seas area, so it involves the south of the UK, the north of France, and the west of uh, northwest of uh, Belgium and the west of Netherlands. Uh, and it's a social innovation project um, which tries to move away from the policing and marginalizing language and rationales of uh, programs uh, that that deal with uh, young people and radicalization and counter radicalization. And we try to focus on youth empowerment and building resilience to grooming and propaganda uh, in relation to violent extremism. Uh, so what we are trying to do is uh, also um, reinforce young people's critical thinking online. So we provide training in relation to fake news, um, misinformation, disinformation, um, and, and how to spot those, how to uh, debunk uh, certain kind of conspiracy theories um, and get information from reliable channels or at least critically uh, consider what information people adopt. Um, and obviously this has been a very serious issue with, with COVID and, and all the conspiracy theories circulating and being also used by um, far-right groups as well. Um, the other thing we, are, we have tried to do with, with Orpheus is also move away from the concept of uh, counter-narratives uh, because it has been found that counter-narratives also are reinforcing of the narratives that we want to tackle in terms of uh, terrorist activity uh, and terrorist propaganda. And we are moving towards suggesting alternatives. And alternatives are not about the narratives that, that are being promoted, but they are positive role model stories, for example. Um, so what we are trying to do is not tell people not to believe propaganda, but uh, talk to them about uh, young people that work for, uh, let's say, fact-checking organizations. Um, show them a, an alternative kind of route to dealing with information that they are um, coming across. The Cyber Ambassadors project um, is, a, is a very different project. It's a localized project that relates to young people being educated in, in different cyber awareness topics um, and going out to their schools, both primary and secondary and even colleges, and, and talking to their peers about the um, different issues. Um, so the, the scheme realized that they needed to expand and, and change the delivery um, and we were brought in essentially to help with reconfiguring how the training happens and what the rationales behind the training are. Um, the, the scheme also highlighted that they were suffering a little bit from training fatigue in terms of actually educating young people about topics that they had consistently and constantly um, interacted with in, in various different kind of activities and initiatives in their schools and even privately as well. So we wanted to move away from the very established kind of ways of talking about the risks and the safeguarding rationales. And we wanted instead to focus on more positive dimensions. So we wanted to train young people in valuable skills and qualities that we felt are necessary in order to achieve this resilience um, and, and this empowerment that we require of them in order to be able to resist uh, certain, uh, certain attempts to victimize them or deal with any kind of uh, information that might be trying to uh, fish them or uh, groom them or whatever. Um, so we focus on reinforcing online critical thinking, um, reinforcing emotional resilience and awareness, uh, establishing principles of digital citizenship and, and, and personal and social responsibility online, um, and also concepts of, of health being online, uh, both mentally and physically and how that translates to our online interactions. Um, and through that, obviously, we engage with the risks and the dangers that might exist online, uh, but they are not the focal point. The focal points are the positive qualities that we want to um, inspire in them. Um, for younger pupils, this also translates to creating superhero figures um, that uh, relate to um, a, a struggle against you know, the, the risks online, which are represented in the form of cyber critters. This is something that um, the, the scheme was already doing in terms of uh, translating and linking certain problems 
online with particular critters that they have identified. And, and what we wanted to do was, again, move towards a more positive uh, dimension where we uh, encourage young people to consider qualities that the superheroes would have um, trying to oppose these cyber critters. Obviously, we're talking about the primary school students here uh, and, and pupils and, and how they would relate to these qualities more easily. Vasily, may I ask you to kind of wrap it up now? Uh, to, uh, to, uh, are you done? Ah, oh, this is a yes. perfect timing then. Okay, uh, so, it's a fascinating story. I like, I like, uh, uh, I like hearing uh, the move away from all this. The, I mean, I like that yes, I uh, logic that uh, that is like a, a new approach in how to to get this um, environment. Years in in doing this, I think we've realized now that. Uh, there's much less responsiveness towards the messages that we are trying to communicate because mm. um, the messages are not changing with the times um, as well and the mentality of the message needs to change, not just the message because, okay, the message might change in terms of talking about a platform or or, or a new problem or how the new, the new problem is phrased and framed, but um, I think we need to move away from the safeguarding mentality and move yeah. towards a more empowering mentality. So. Thank you. This is our website uh, for the clinic and our email and LinkedIn and Twitter. So please follow us, see what we're doing. We're doing more uh, projects and we're very keen to get involved. One topic um, I, I really want to do research on is uh, internet addiction and gaming addiction and, and how we can support young people with that. So if anyone is interested in topics like this, please do get in touch. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so uh, next next one up on the final um, presenter on this panel before our before before our lunch break and Q and A's for the whole uh, for all the panelists is Callum McMillan from the University of Leicester. Callum. <clears throat> Howdy. Hi. Uh, you can see me, right? Uh, uh well, I'm, it's trying. It's trying to it's, get you there. There's an attempt. Uh, there's tell you an what, attempt. While, that's, while that's doing that, let me load up the old slides. Ooh. Now, where are you? So, Callum is my personal hero as well, because he's uh, teaching uh, so I can uh, do some research for us as well. So, he's uh, my favorite one. So, so we cannot see you, but uh, neither. I mean, I don't know, Matt. Uh, can can you help here, or do, do do you know how to share? I can't see. Like this presentation, yeah, or if, if you oh, it's it's fine. I can I can uh, do the slides just fine. Okay. Uh, okay. You should be seeing them now. There you go. Yes. Cool. So video's not cooperating, so we'll we'll forget about that. Okay. Uh, so we'll pop that back up. There you go. So, so we're um, getting the stream, I think, yeah. Okay. So bear with me. Uh, hit the old F5. Right, so you can see that, right? Yep. Nice and clear. Yeah. All right, awesome. Uh, so let me just set a timer so I don't go overboard. So this one's going to be um, a little different as well. So... Again, uh, happy to be here, happy to um, talk over all of this sort of stuff with you guys. The, the things I've seen so far are, are pretty interesting. Uh, this, on the other hand, is a mere uh, PhD thesis that's kind of um, outlived its uh, usefulness. So this was um, a study that was originally done two-ish years ago. So um, finished off as a PhD, then worked into a book over the course of uh, probably a longer amount of time than it needed to do, but um, long story short, what I dealt with um, was ideas of transhumanism and, and posthumanism in video games. Um, now, what does that exactly have to do with uh, mental health and well-being? Well, I'll get back to you on that in just a few minutes. But before that, I figure I might as well um, talk about what I was well, aiming to do with this particular body of work. So, um, in this case, the research aims were uh, relatively simple. So, the first one was to see how these sort of um, philosophical ideas had spread throughout media with, with emphasis on 
you know, various um, films and, and TV. But I, I'm going to ignore that part. I'm going to pretend that pit doesn't exist and, and focus mostly on the, the video game aspect, which honestly was, was my main focus to begin with. Um, and of course, that yeah, focuses more on interaction and, and creation. Uh, the second one, um, less to do with the, with the current sort of um, the state of affairs, but it, um, I wanted to see oh, basically how narcissistic we were. Uh, the idea of replicating humanity, um, being very humanocentric or uh, anthropocentric, sorry, I should say. Um, and how this was reproduced not only through what we see um, in games or in, in other media, but also through fandom and uh, particularly uh, a set of gamers who I interviewed, about 30-ish uh, of them as memory serves. Uh, so, well, to get you up to scratch with what the philosophies are, there, there are a couple of contentious ones, uh, uh, very high with the, with the big sci-fi buffs, um, and they are often interchangeable. So transhumanism, uh, in brief, is yeah, the idea of changing one's body, um, usually through... Um, you know, would be scientific methods, some of which are very possible, some of which uh, lie fully in the, the realm of fantasy. So, anything from sort of genetic therapy, uh, base level cybernetics or prosthetics, all the way up to your, your kind of Terminator level cyborg, which is at the fantastical end of the scale, shall we say. Um, but of course, that's the thing, it's, it's not all fantasy and, and sort of make believe for sure. Um, even sort of glasses that I wear. Uh, the technology that we use to interconnect with each other um, in itself, uh, video games included. Um, the idea of a virtual world is, is very transhuman in its execution uh, in how it expands our abilities and expands our imagination far more than it would otherwise have been. Um, so to consider oneself post-human then is what you consider, I guess, the extreme of that. You know, it, it, Rooted in your, your standard superhuman theory, I guess, in that you know, you become something else, something indistinguishable. Maybe you become a cube or something made of um, of bits and bytes. But of course, that's the thing. That's not often the case. Um, a lot of these constructs, a lot of these beings uh, are imagined by ourselves. Maybe that's our own sort of special <clears throat> condition that we sort of have to imagine things through our lens because, well, ultimately there, there may be no other choice. Um, so, sorry, where was I? Um, so what did I do to actually accomplish this? Um, honestly, it's a fever dream uh, thinking about it myself, given that you know the, the apocalypse happened between doing the PhD and then doing the book. But what I did effectively was choosing a bunch of um, particularly notable um, video games at the time. Uh, I was able to yeah pick some the pretty popular ones in that, that matched the sort of descriptors of, of what I was looking for. And, yeah, um, and a bunch of others that, that vaguely fit into the sci-fi lens and took a look at them, just standard semiotic textual analysis to see what was, uh, well, going on with the themes there. But the more important part and the more um, sort of uh, interesting part were the sort of interviews I did with these people in fandom, with the people who played the games, who weren't like me. I, they weren't, you know, examining every nook and cranny and, and sort of scrutinizing it under you know, this scholar and that scholar, these were people who, you know, either played casually or, um, you know, maybe they watched a few sci-fi movies as well, but otherwise these things were often very new to them or they were, I, and the things that I asked them ranged, uh, quite a bit from just sort of basic, um, you know, what, what kind of stuff have you seen that, that matches, uh, sort of the descriptor I gave of, of trans and post-humanism? Did they have their own descriptor of it? Um, what did they think they would do if they had, you know, abilities or, or sort of things like that that were, you know, beyond the pale? Um, and I'll get to the the answers of that uh, very very shortly. Um, and yes, so um, as for the discussion around the two, uh, I melded them together into basically theories that merged ideas of the body of the self, uh, of identity and of power, one leading naturally to the other. So yeah, sort of bodily existence creates identity, which creates power structures, which then kind of go in a e eternal sort of loop. So moving on, 
Uh, oh, and um, these were some of the key games I looked at for my uh, central case studies. Um, if if my camera had actually you know bothered to actually activate, uh, you would have seen this particular poster. A uh, big fan of the first one, uh, always have been. Um, and the second one, and also a key film that I used to contrast the difference uh, between screen media and uh, game media, of course, again, being that focus on cinematic themes versus the focus on interactive ability. Um, so the Xenoblade games in particular, they are JRPGs, so Japanese role-playing games, uh, in which um, you've got your fairly regular sort of um, sci-fi plots, you've got your cyborgs, you've got your you know, would-be gods, would-be superhumans, um, all of the sort of themes that you would come to expect from something like this. Um, but the gameplay as well very much led to this idea of, of being a, a transhuman or being more um, than you otherwise might be. Uh, and of course, the film I studied, uh, which again, not wholly relevant to what we're talking about, but uh, Ex Machina also, yep, yeah, would recommend... Um, and also has a very interesting kind of discussion on this, but also in relation to other uh, intersectional topics. Uh, you have sort of um, discussions of feminism, discussion of race in there as well, uh, notably, uh, which I would go into if, if we weren't so strapped for time. So what I will do instead um, is kind of a bridge what I found. So when we're talking about RPGs, when we're talking, I mean, chances are some of you or, or most of you even will probably be familiar with how they work. Um, but yeah, the, the ability to level up, to, to power up, to equip oneself with different things, uh, you know, fantastical or otherwise, um, again, gives a feeling of progression and it gives a feeling of, uh, of enhancement that is very unique, uh, to video games, uh, even to, not necessarily to even games of that genre, um, but simply things that we can generally interact with and change, you know, whether it's a virtual dollhouse sort of scenario, uh, or something a little more action-based. Um, but otherwise, as you can see, uh, the stories, again, were ranging from sort of high concept to fairly standard space opera sci-fi. Um, the idea of, you know, your, your classic ship of Theseus sort of deal. What if all of humanity were replaced by the robots they decided to put their consciousnesses into? Is, is that something that we would consider to be people? And, and then again, what would be the, the sort of traumas and, and stresses that they would, would go through as well as a result? Um, these are sort of things that, again, I'll, I'll go into shortly, um, cause, um, again, it should be said, um, that even though sort of, um, the ideas of mental health and the ideas of, of sort of well-being weren't things that went into the initial concepts of, of this, like, thesis of this book, uh, they definitely, uh, were central to what I built the literature on, and, and that's what we'll be moving on to next. Uh, oh, uh, and before I forget... So basically, um, all of this together, the, the games, uh, the film, the interviewees, it basically uh, affirmed uh, what I had been sort of hypothesizing. So yeah, we, we do sort of think of, of how these things can benefit us. Uh, we, we think in, in things that are very human-shaped. Um, and yeah, um, again, we, we worry about what will happen if uh, the wrong hands um, you know decide who does get to become a a sort of transhuman or otherwise uh, anything of the kind. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't yeah, take much imagination to, to figure out why that might be. So, okay. So moving on to then the, the actual links um, with the sort of stuff um, related to the symposium. So a lot of the background info I found uh, relating to well-being, development, mental health, um, well, there was the first one, which uh, went into a lot of... Um, ideas of what it meant to sort of change one's body, whether virtually or otherwise. So you have the idea of um, sort of playing another gender or playing without gender in the case of, um, again, things like World of Warcraft. Um, again, this isn't necessarily exclusive to just that. A lot of games are, are starting to see these kind of options. Um, and as a result, people have the ability to use this for sort of therapeutic purposes or, or as a way to, yeah, to sort of experiment perhaps. Which can, of course, yeah, like anyone could tell you, that would be, yeah, for the most part beneficial for sort of, yeah, mental health in that regard. Um, on the flip side, the idea of sexuality itself, um, uh, Ornella, the man I, I used to know, he, he talked very much a lot about um, the ideas 
of technology being driven by sort of the sex industry of all things and and so that in itself you know what what does it change the idea does it change ideas of sexuality of how we express it um you know as bodies as sort of ideas of bodies change and, and sort of develop uh that much is yeah like absolutely possible I, I do go into it in regards i think specifically with one of the games um i believe xenoblade where that kind of topic is uh, to an extent explored uh oh and then of course um going a bit further back in time you have uh ideas of yeah just simple sort of um sort of building blocks of video games being used for sort of behavioral development uh for ideas of you know seeking control or mastery basic desires that we have as, as sort of people um, and, and yeah, these, these kind of, this ability to sort of, um, learn from this and, and develop it in ways that, you know, are, are otherwise only enabled by technology, say Minecraft, for instance, you know, powerful teaching tool as, as, um, we, we sort of discussed earlier, but yeah, like that very much is, is the sort of very picture of transhumanism in its own right. Um, especially when you take it onto a sort of massively multiplayer context so of many people doing this sort of thing at once, um, which sort of multiplies this by a factor of, you know, goodness knows how much. But okay, so, ah, there we go. I, I wondered if I was at the end, so I'm just about at time, I think. Um, so I would say, yeah, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed. Uh, shame you didn't get a chance to see me, but we'll see if we can't fix that later. Uh, so, uh, well, I guess that's me. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Callum. Uh, this um, always fascinated me, uh, the, the idea of, of how, uh, how you could get your research participants to talk about this concept uh, and get information from them in how they view uh, the posthuman, the future human, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, wonderful. Um, I would like to open the floor for questions um, and the Q&A now for all the panelists. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get uh, my uh, video to start, but uh, it says that it's not available for more than 25 people, so we must be more than 25 then. But never mind. Um, uh, are there any questions? People can um, also uh, unmute themselves and, and ask the question, identify uh, who you are. Is there anyone that uh, would like to ask uh, a question to the panelists at this point? Well, I saw, if yeah. I look into the questions channel, there's been a lot of discussion uh -huh. in the back channel while these presentations have been going on. So why don't we, we go back and uh, our first one, we'll go back to it. There was a lot of discussion happening around Mark's paper in particular. Um, I know Emma had a lot to say uh, in response. If, if Emma, if you wanted to kind of, for those of of us in the uh, symposium who haven't been into that uh, questions channel to, to read as this sort of discussion has been going forth. If either of you wanted to kind of bring that discussion in here, that would be great. I would be happy to. Um, do you want to ask the questions, Emma, or shall I say something? I can ask you a question. <laughs> How's it going, Mark? Um, yeah, it was a, there was a lot of really great presentations. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think I was really interested in some of the stuff Mark was saying around um, how streamers deem themselves successful on Twitch. Like, is there a point, is, is there a trouble there that there's never an end point to success? Like, you're just heading towards being the next ninja? Um, because there seems like there could be a happy balance somewhere, but there's never an end point. So I was really wondering, you use the language around... Um, being successful, if there's anything specifically about that that they talked about. Yeah, thank you for that question, Emma. Um, so sorry about the um, kind of background hum on my uh, voice. Um, like I said on chat, in spite of being on one of those mega gaming laptops, the uh, microphone is a piece of garbage. Um, so yeah, um, 
I think a lot of streamers and most of those who I talked to were defining success in kind of financial slash career terms whereby this is something where you make a part-time living from this or um, it could be something which you make a full-time living from but there's definitely within the context of these kind of mental health focused um, Twitch game streamers I think that there's definitely a different metric of success which some of them expressed which is a little bit more focused on do I have a stream which supports my mental health? Do I have a stream which helps others with theirs? Um, do I have a kind of community with a, with a clear um, identity, a clear form, a clear sort a clear kind of shape to it? Um, and like I kind of said a little bit in the chat, also there's um, a certain aspect where. Lots of these streamers take on this almost kind of therapeutic role where um, viewers will share, in some cases, quite strikingly private things about um, a lost parent or a parent who's got some awful illness or um, a lost uh, pet or that they've been fired from work, this type of stuff. Um, and I think a lot of these mental health focus streamers would definitely define success, at least in part, along the lines of are they supporting their viewers and in turn are their viewers supporting them? Um, because a lot of these streamers can kind of elicit a lot of sympathy from their viewers at times as well. Um, yeah, yeah, so I think for most of those who we talked to, it did have that kind of financial career sense, but that's probably just because in large part we were talking to uh, financially successful streamers, but I think a lot of them also see the kind of creation of these safe or these inclusive gaming plus mental health plus real talk is a phrase which you see quite a lot. Um, I, th I think a lot of them also see the, the creation of those sorts of streams as being a big uh, positive as well, yeah. Thanks. On that uh, discussion, I think one thing that's really interesting to me is um, the rise of, of I guess, um, mental health discourse on platforms like Twitch. Uh, you know, I think about um, streamers like Dr. K at the moment, for example. Um, these, uh, when Dr. K's case, a, a, um, a psychiatrist, a practicing psychiatrist in New York, who has a, 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 a sizable Twitch following now, um, and someone who invites these uh, Twitch streamers onto his shows um, very carefully under the guise of life coaching as opposed to solicited medical advice <laughs> and the impact that this has um, both positive and negative. So obviously, you know, it's great that, that this is that Twitch, for example, is uh, supporting a streamer like this, who's uh, raising um, the profile of, of uh, I guess, like a normative discussion around mental health for streamers as a way for young audiences to uh, engage with this kind of discourse. Uh, but there are, I don't know if anyone else has any concerns uh, as I do, but I do have concerns about, um, you know, when, uh, you know, as Mark, when you, when you talk about Twitch as being like a monetized platform and how people are quite um, creative in terms of, uh, uh, finding ways to re remunerate themselves, you know, through their online practices. When you've got these these you know um, therapists on Twitch, you know, seemingly having this this wholesome discussion about mental health, um, but th there is that element of of well, you know, but I'm still taking sub money and donation money, you know, from these viewers. Um, it, it's not a very regulated space, I suppose, and and legally he's protecting himself, and people like him are protecting themselves by saying it's life coaching, um, but we don't really understand yet um, what the impact that this is having. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what you or, or Emma or anyone else who's familiar with this kind of stuff thought about that, but it, it, that's what I was thinking about, you know, when you were talking about the, the positives and negatives of, of Twitch and, and how on the one hand, it's great that it, it provides spaces for these discussions to take place in these supportive communities. Um, but there is that kind of question uh, that at least arises for me in terms of, well, when money becomes involved, you know, people are subscribing and, and kind of, you know, donating and, and whatnot. Um, 
I don't know what I you think do. I'll jump in on that one. So yeah, I I mean the the money industry you buy a book or you're listening to a podcast that's going to happen anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. But I think it's for me it's the the capture of someone else's um, trauma or issues and that that gets monetized in the live stream that becomes the the tricky bit to be navigating. Um, yeah, I haven't heard of that one before, but I'll definitely go have a look at it, um, Matt. And, you know, we know of a number of other, um, you know, fellow academics who, who have made cottage industries about around uh, this sort of life coaching. Um, and it's it's troublesome as well because life coaching suddenly becomes the soft version, sort of you're carrying your academic credentials but using them in a very sort of flippant uh, general way. I, I think there's a, a troublesome mix between it. Yeah, I I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, because I think money comes uh, into it in a very big way in China with Tencent and what Yupei was talking about as well. And what is the influence of of this on the esports athletes and and the pressures that they're under to perform, whether there are mental health issues there that she has identified? So that was one for Yupei. But I was thinking... Where Vasilis was talking, I was thinking, well, could some of these live streaming scenarios and and talking directly to people that are gaming, um, kind of setting up something like this might help some of the projects he's involved with in reaching out and creating a super node with different stakeholders of, of this story of what you do with children to avoid the protecting them the protection you know the the protection discourse um, if if anything like that could be used mindful of the more the, the political economy of it so to speak so these were my two th- things that i thought while we we're discussing this would you like me to comment on that or is it just a thought uh, yes, I would like you to go where you think that uh, this kind of streaming might be a tool to reach out to these uh, communities uh, that are already online, these young people are online, rather than going through the schools and the, the, the how difficult that is, that we all know it is very difficult. Yeah, I, I think the challenge with doing that is how do you get the acceptance um, as part of the platform, you know, with the school, you have this level of access that they give you. And obviously, um, at the same time, you have the negative dimension of going through the school. So people would perceive you as another kind of branch of this structure. Uh, whereas if you're going directly in the in the streams, then this is uh, something that's really beneficial and, and far more direct. I mean, one of, one of the things um, I did once, uh, I was doing a session with NHS nurses working in schools. Um, and one of the scenarios we were looking at was um, the dichotomy between internet addiction and someone going uh, and, and training as a, as a professional gamer. And how do you manage this? How do we, for example, consider new professions that young people aspire to, such as being YouTube influencers? or professionally sports gamers, and how do we advise schools, parents, and everyone else um, to actually encourage them and, and reinforce these decisions, because these are legitimate jobs and and professions and, and hobbies that, that people would like to do. Um, so how do we support them instead of actually consider them as addicts? Obviously, if someone wants to be a high-ranking professional esports athlete, they need to practice in the same way that uh, a footballer would practice multiple hours a day. Um, but we wouldn't we wouldn't complain if uh, our child was saying, "I want to go and play football for eight hours." Or maybe we would, but anyway, not as much as we would if someone said, "You know what? I want to play uh, FIFA for uh, twelve hours a day." So for me, yeah, this, is, yeah. this is a new challenge. Um, and I, th- I think there's there's a long way to go in terms of uh, managing that with everyone else around the children that needs that level of uh, awareness and education to deal with and support them in these in this, uh, efforts. I, I think that's a great point, um, although I think it's also kind of um, important, of course, to keep in mind that, that these kind of Twitch jobs or esports jobs and so on are super, are super precarious for one thing, of course, and 
sadly have a trend to have a tremendous amount of luck involved. I mean, if there's one kind of big thing which, um, for instance, my own work on Twitch has shown is that for every Twitch streamer who, say, can make a full-time income from it, there's at least 50 people who worked as hard and made streams that were just as good. But the one who who um, who kind of made it um, was, to use a sports term, discovered at some point, um, and that gave them then a big kind of boost and so on. Um, and so I think while I completely agree about kind of trying to avoid this very kind of uh, daft game game um, addiction discourse, we also I think should still keep in mind that. It's great to shoot for the moon, but the moon is very, very hard to hit, and there's a tremendous amount of luck as well as skill and hard work and effort and labour and all these sorts of things which um, which go in there too. And I think it's tricky to articulate that because any focus on luck is so kind of at odds with with the kind of prevailing sort of neoliberal idea of you can have any job you want as long as you work hard and you're skilled and all those things. But actually, in terms of Twitch at least, and I suspect esports is the same, it it doesn't really, I think, completely hold up there. Yeah, yeah. Can I? Uh, can yes, I please, make... you, pay, uh, you, pay, you must have some findings there from China to share there. Yeah, uh, in terms of the live streaming, I have a bit concern about the live streaming actually force some players into the uh, economic driven career path. Uh, the, the, the salary gap of the average annual income of this kind of players can be between, um, for example, in pounds, like one pound to 20 pounds. So there's a huge, uh, huge, huge gap. Uh, so, so actually, I have no idea what exactly the that live streaming as the button streaming of the value chain uh, could play as a positive role to drive the, the professional career. Uh, the second question, uh, uh, second concerns uh, for me is because those players we are talking about are so young, they only have the middle school degree or high school, which means when they retired, they don't, they don't have the, uh, they don't have a, 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 a competitive degree to, to compete with those students who are go for the tra traditional way. So now what I have, uh, the data I have collected from Tencent, they are leading a project to cooperate with uh, university or colleagues. Uh, they try to, you know, send their athletes to the university when they are off, um, off the tournaments. So they're trying to uh, make up those people who are lack of the degrees. Otherwise, esports in China are still uh, significantly stigmatized by the public. So, but 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 uh, so far the data is not map up. Uh, the whole story because I found there is still a gap, um, the, the, in particular the attitude uh, from the staffs who worked from the university at like my university, a uh, top one, and the attitude of the staff who worked uh, as the, uh, the, the second tier of the, of the colleagues a college in in China, they, they have different attitude to move forward uh, the esports courses. So now, uh, even though there are almost 80 uh, esports courses in China have launched, uh, officially launched since 2016, but 18% of them are based on uh, low level of the college. Uh, so, which means that the university on the top are still um, afraid to open this kind of courses because uh, a lot of elder professionals, which is, I have heard that before, uh, they will complain that esports courses uh, were opened in the university because they thought that would be this, uh, they will, how to say, this connect, uh, distract the, the young, the student that not focus on the study, but on playing games. Okay. 
So you pay, are you, sorry, I'm going to jump in. Are you yeah. saying that um, uh, these courses are in part opened up like a TAFE course? You're saying they're sort of at the bottom level, like a technical degree in part to sort of pick up the uh, the esports athletes that don't have anywhere else to put their sort of, you know, uh, in, internal skills to work? Is that what's happening? Yes, yes. But actually those uh, technic um college um they 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 bring in those people who are good at good at playing tournaments but they couldn't oh. offer a, a a very good quality uh courses um so they just bring in and ask them okay you help us to play the tournaments i offer you a degree after that so actually there are a lot of big issues in practice right now Right, so it's not focused on becoming like a technical production manager or an observer or something that could go straight back into any other kind of media or live streaming industry. It's just you know, there are some courses um, like focus on live streaming, uh, how to how to do how to be a good manager in sport or a live streamer in esports. But the clubs, the voices from the clubs, they say that there's still a gap. Uh, they don't want to hire the employ the, those students from that um, major because they 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 saw um, the 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 lack of the experience doing so. So uh, the the class right now they are leading another project on education. For example, in China, there now there's a new job. It's called uh, uh, a a job that persuade persuade you to give up the e-sport industry. <laughs> I don't know how to translate, but those uh, projects actually is like a, 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 a MOOC lab um, that help the children to realize how talented you are to play the e-sport. Otherwise, you have to go back to go for the traditional uh, study, uh, you know. So the, the clubs, are leading different project and the university or the colleagues uh, are, are leading different way. Um, so now there's a huge gap between the different stakeholders to co coordinate the education. That sounds a little bit scarily like an Eastern German uh, talent identification in sports, uh, but all right. Uh, but there's that same gap happens in Australia too. So, I mean, with the the, the big time sports players, right? They get picked up as 14, 15 year olds, don't go to school. But the the sports institution uh, from government has been pushed to, you have to give them opportunities in terms of um, learning through technical school or having mentors along the way. So it'd be really interesting to see and continue watching your work to see what happens in that space. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Were there any other questions that any of the panelists wanted to sort of direct at each other? I know that um, I think Athena, you said that you had some uh, earlier. Uh, I don't know if you want to pick up on those threads, or would you like me to? Yeah, I mean, uh, you you can uh, pick up on threads. I mean, uh, I was when uh, Manolis was and Callum uh, was talking with more like the historical philosophical story. I was thinking. Uh, about uh, the fact that if you if you see something materializing in the digital uh, space, let's say some digital materialization of something, uh, then how how um, how do we think about the the actual, let's say, so something might happen and uh, or not happen in the Deleuzean virtuality sense. This is what Manolis was actually talking about. But if you have digital materialization, does the actual follow or not? And what are the conditions to which it follows? So it's about kind of this um, actual digital virtual digital material like a kind of difference and i was thinking about uh, this uh, when manolis was talking and also in relation to aspiring to uh, modifications that might be possible or not and how do this materialize in the physical um sense so uh that Callum was talking about you know 
um, body changes, extensions, and so on. And 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 right now, quite a lot of this stuff is actually possible. So if you have this digital materialization, what are the the chances that you have, have uh, an actual uh, physical manifestation? Let's say. I mean, I've looked at this issue more in terms of digital activism and where you have. Um, protest and when does it transfer all, uh, all offline into the real and all that kind of stuff myself. But I was just uh, uh, wanted to involve uh, Manolis and Callum perhaps in this more kind of philosophical discussion um, here, if they have anything to say, to uh, feel inspired. Yeah, I'm, I'm still around. Just out of curiosity, can you actually see me now? Ooh, there we go. Very nice. But no, uh, so going to what you were saying about the idea of uh, the digital affecting the sort of uh, physical, I would say certainly with the idea of, um, I know people have been developing prosthetics to help sort of disabled people um, play games to do sort of very effective degrees, although that's, I guess, more physical to physical. But if we were going back to the point I was saying about uh, learning behavioral skills, learning cognitive skills. Um, that is something that, yeah, very much would affect the real, uh, much like any learned skill, uh, I would say. Um, but then again, why, whereas good ideas and good sort of memes and, and things can be transmitted, I suppose so too uh, can dangerous ones then as well. Um, and if we were to look at it in a streaming context, you'd, you'd look at things like doxing, right? You're looking at things in ways you can disseminate information and then, you know, go after people in the real world. Uh, or at least that's just what's floating on the top of my head, if anyone wanted to add to that. Um, I think uh, it's a very difficult discussion. And uh, the question is very challenging in the sense that so far we can only outline a possible philosophical uh, answer. Um, I mean, one point has to do with um, the fact that um, we should uh, go beyond the traditional distinctions. So the distinction between real and um, digital or phys physical and digital um, is, a, I think it, it, it's, it's an old distinction. We have to move beyond this. Um, I can't answer the question, how can we move beyond this distinction? I mean, how do we experience this, this new uh, status? But um, I think this is the real challenge to perceive digital condition as a new state of uh, reality, so to say, not as an additional um, locus for doing things, but as a new state, an overall new state of reality. Um, so, um, in this um, um, in this sense, we need to redefine, I think, um, uh, other very deeply entrenched traditional uh, concepts like uh, body, like um, materiality. And uh, one way I would indicate towards this direction would be to try, for example, to disconnect body from materiality and connect it with performativity. So um, we can answer some questions uh, concerning the digital space and things that happen there uh, using this, uh, this new association. Because if we remain attached to the notion of materiality, we, 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 we can't answer uh, any new question. I mean. So um, there are some indications, some insights uh, towards the new um, projects and the new directions we have to to move, um, and 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 concerning history, of course, things are much more easier because we can make the past to perform itself. It's it's really easier, and um, um, other things like uh, being online, um, experiencing the digital uh, condition 
are much more uh, demanding. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, there is time uh, for uh, possibly one more question, uh, if anyone has it, uh, uh, or a comment. Um, if, if that is a no, we might even go to an earlier lunch here. We might just like the, the you know thinking of the body and. and uh, unless, Matt, you have uh, uh, anything from the chat. Otherwise, I think we could break and uh, we're going to be here back here at 2 o'clock uh, for the second panel of the day. Yep, I think, I think that's a nice cap-off point there. Okay, great. So we'll see you all uh, in about uh, an hour or so.